evident is Shaka Mayanja's story, rooted from a love for music that he explored into a field for not only growing talent for many that have drunk from his cup, but a whole industry that is today reaping from his noble transparency. At 47, with the idea of retirement thrown back into the wilderness, children and marriage may still be an option or not, but Shaka's love for what he does remains supreme. Let's talk about your shift from reggae to jazz. Mm -hmm. Was it inspired by probably your earlier inspirations to jazz? Because I understand you've also done it, right? Yes, yes. Um, at, actually, that, this happened uh, around 2001, maybe. Mm -hmm. We'd already done out of reggae. By then it was... We took it as far as we could take it, because mm. reggae took over. All the new artists were doing a form of reggae dancehall and all that. Mm. But then I was, I think, in England at the time, and there was a channel that used to play a lot of jazz and blues. Even the history, biopics of everybody from Ray Charles to Miles to talking about the whole history. And you could tell that reggae comes from that, because reggae comes from the blues, because the blues is the roots. The rest is the fruits, as one, as Willie Dixon said, mm. from R and B, soul, reggae, um, everything comes from the blues. So I studied out of that, and where and what it came out of, it came out of anguish, you know, just like reggae. It was a, it was protest music, you know, a people in a certain condition, who sang about their trials, you know. Yeah. So that's how blues. So there's a very huge connection. So reggae, reggae you're the saying blues. the blues and jazz are informed uh, by message? Oh, yes. Even jazz, I mean, comes out, blues comes out of the delta from the plantations, left plantations. Mm. So is it the message that informs the sound of the instruments? Oh, Please yes. teach us. Because, the, the, because the, that, that, that music, it is what they call soul music. Mm -hmm. These guys, nobody taught them music. They just started playing and singing just comes spiritually, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's why many of them could not even read music at all. And they wrote great works. Mm -hmm. So, the, so the, I saw the connection. It was all protest mu mu you know, music. Even the civil rights music comes out of all that. The, mm -hmm. the whole movement. It was musicians and preachers and, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but uh, jazz became very technical later on, you know? It has so many subgenres. So that's when I, I used to write based on bass playing, for instance, without actually knowing how to play the bass, mm. without any a bit of piano. So I, I picked up a bass and started teaching myself, mm -hmm. mainly reggae. So I taught myself how to play bass. So I, I joined so many forums of instrumentalists who are globally and were you know, exchanging, talking about African music, and there was a similarity. Mm -hmm. So when I came back around 2004, five. I decided to do a project, you know, like a prototype, something that hadn't been done. So I did a, I wrote an album for Angela Canole, you know, mm -hmm. called Dark Chocolate, which was lovers rock reggae, but with a lot of jazz influences. And I played everything on that show. I mean, on the, on the album, I Dark played all the instruments, I wrote the music. Dark Chocolate has what, what kind of songs? If you it, uh, I'll send you a link. It's, it's, you can find it on any of the global platforms. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were one of the first people to do that, even mm -hmm. putting music on the global platform. You know, mm -hmm. people hadn't done it before. It's common now. 2004, it wasn't. Yeah. So we did that record, you know, with Angela Carole. You know, people saw in a different light from that album. And then uh, that's when I met Elijah. Elijah Stack. I was doing the jazz show on uh, Radio One. And we said, why don't we do a jazz gathering here? It was here, it was still in Genoa at mm. the time. So through the radio program, we started meeting every month. I think it was on a Thursday. And place used to, f you know, full up mystique, two floors. And we were just watching DVDs of a chosen artist. You know, like maybe with Shade or Anita Baker or, or um, Lyric Now. You know, the people were listening to on radio. Yeah. So I came up with the idea, say, you know, maybe once a year, we can actually get one of those people from the DVDs, like in December, and then do a show, and people actually see them. 
So I contacted some of the guys through MySpace. You don't even know what MySpace is. People know Facebook now and all this, but my, <laughs> MySpace was original, especially for musicians. <laughs> yeah, original. <laughs> it was in regional networking. I've heard of it. Yeah, uh -huh, MySpace. <laughs> so I spoke to the bass player who was playing on one of the DVDs. Yeah. He linked me up to another drummer. And then we said, you know, 2008, let's do a jazz safari. And we did it in the parking of the stick outdoors. Actually, we call it the sizzling jazz safari. With which artist? Remind uh, us. Eric, Eric Mariantho, who we had watched on the DVD. And the drama Oscar Seaton. Oscar Seaton now, I mean, he was playing with George Benson, he plays for Lionel Richie and all these big guys. Mm -hmm. So we brought them in, in the parking. Then I got some Ugandan musicians that I played. I got my friend Henry Older from England. Uh, Michael Uma was then starting, he was on stage with us, Harry Loanga. Um, Ugandan, so we had a mixture. Desire from Kenya, Wakake from Kenya. We did a, the whole thing was to use Ugandan regional musicians performing his music. Mm. So that's what actually the first safaris were about that. Then from there it went to uh, Serena with MTN, I believe. We did Eric um, Marianthal and Chuck Lobb, who's, uh, who's deceased now. First time in Africa for them. Yeah. So we did a show with them again. Um, then it, it grew up from that. So, but then what it did also was most of the instrumentalists then, people are still using backing tracks. When, in 2004, bands were, bands were dead from 95. Mm. And I blame Peter Sematimba for that. Okay. <laughs> he did that. He had Dungeon Studio and all that, but he started doing shows, promotion, promotion of shows with the local artists. And they were using backing trucks. It was cheaper. So they had backing trucks, so Lugogo was full, Masaka. They made a lot of money. So it made sense business wise mm. for them to do that. So by, the, by 2004, I think the, the cycle was changing. So, but still, most of the instrumentalists were in church. So most of those boys could not appear anywhere. So when we started the jazz safari, slowly by slowly started coming out of, of the churches. churches. And right now the whole scene is full of bands. Yeah. I mean, the entire city has bands. There's a band everywhere. And all these are church boys. Mm. At the time, they were in the shell. But when we started doing music, you know, jazz, people came out of their shell. Isaac Atuma himself. Mm. He probably doesn't remember, but he gave me a call, 2000, I think, five. He was in England. Mm -hmm. Then the internet was very scarce here, so I was at Web City uh, Internet Cafe. That call lasted about 45 minutes. He would remember, 45-minute call. He called me, and he was frustrated. Like, he was in England, you know, music here, jazz, but coming to you. I told him, man, you know, you need to, because I studied, Ray Charles was blind. But he, he moved from a state to another state with nothing, you know? Yeah. He, a leap of faith. You want to do something? Come and change it. So you told yeah. him to come back See, home? I told him, yeah. You, you saw it. I told him, send me the music first. So he sent me the CDs. I gave them to some, you know, Fred Masade, some Mugoya. I uh, gave Elijah to play on the station, you know? He came back and did his first show at La Bonita. But the pep talk was, you know, people need to stop to... Stop feeling sorry for themselves. Yeah. Because um, I've I'd, I'd seen the story and learned the story of everybody, from Moses Matov of, of Afrigo to Miles Levis. None of them got it easy, you know? <laughs> people, people are talking about us, oh, we don't have studio here, and the radios don't play music, and I was laughing. I don't listen to that anymore. Okay. If you're an artist, don't come to me with that, mm. you know? Because nobody had, none of them, Richard Bonner, all these guys went through you know, they were chosen to do that. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> if maybe you're failing because you're not chosen to do that, <laughs> do something spiritual. else, man. <laughs> if, you have, if you have to do music for money, get a job. Don't do music. Okay. You'll never get money from music. Okay. If you're getting money from music, you are not called to do music. You're a businessman. If I may ask, with the whole reggae and jazz, and how you were drawn into that kind of music. What is it? Was it spiritual? Wasn't you chosen to be inspired yeah. by our very own African beats? Well, uh, the music comes from Africa. Of, yeah, from our very own. If it's the beat. You know, original, no, like original Afro uh, folk. Uh, yeah, but, the folk. But that's how I started in primary. 
spiritual music, traditional spiritual music. That's what we are playing in the school choir with Mr. Kayofu and Mr. Kayanji and Mr. Katumba. That's all we did, folk music. Okay, now, there are a lot of people who make money out of music. Because music is an industry. The person who supplies the equipment, the, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole machine. Mm -hmm. Musicians you might not make money, but there are other people who are making money out of that music. Yeah. So a lot of the chosen people 